So in this set of videos, we're going to uh, switch from where we've been talking about, which was uh, point reference spatial data, to now talking about our, our third and last class of, of spatial data models, which are block referenced data. So as I mentioned in the, the first lecture I gave on, on spatial data and spatial data analysis, um, the block reference data is data that has an attribute of location, which all of our spatial data has. It has some attribute at that location, some you know, uh, y, which is what we're, or z, which is what we're interested in understanding. <clears throat> and it has this attribute of area. So in point reference data, you had a location and that attribute at a point. Uh, now you have that um, attribute expressed on an area basis instead of at a point. Uh, it is very common, typical for block reference data to be contiguous. So you have uh, different areas that are uh, adjacent to each other. And in you know, traditional GIS fashion, you know, uh, I would say that block reference data generally comes in, in two forms. You have raster data coming from you know, gridded data products and, and remote sensing, and you have uh, vector data, <clears throat> data coming from you know, polygons. Uh, um, and you know, a lot of what you'll see a lot of uh, out there are going to be uh, data sets that are referenced at the you know, relative to, to political boundaries, to state boundaries, to county boundaries, to township boundaries. So a lot of aerial-based data, uh, block reference data, is going to be data that's you know, often stored in GIS layers um, and associated with survey statistics or, or other sort of measurements uh, that are made uh, at those, and aggregated at those, those political units or, or some other units. Political units are, are particularly common, which you'll encounter for block reference data. Um, that said, often what we're trying to do when modeling block reference data is, is to conceive of there being some underlying surface that we're trying to understand, uh, some response surface, some, some you know, uh, either that surface itself or how that surface relates to other things. Uh, and what we end up observing is uh, the area integral or the area mean of some underlying surface that is continuous. So you might imagine, uh, you know, right now if you are, uh, you know, getting uh, summary statistics on, you know, COVID cases on a national or state or uh, county level, uh, that underneath, you know, underneath that is some, you know, more, you know, closer to continuous surface of, of uh, you know, risk and, and infection. Uh, that you might be trying to understand, and it just happens that the way we observe these things are are blocked into these uh, units that often are, are you know sometimes arbitrary relative to the process we're trying to understand. So we might imagine if we're observing z for block i, that what we're actually saying is there's some underlying z for any spatial location, and we're integrating over that block or so averaging over that block. Um, so like with uh, very analogous to what we had with, with spatial point data, uh, point reference data, um, there's generally two things that people are trying to do with block reference data. Uh, one is kind of the general mapping goal. We're trying to estimate that underlying surface or estimate uh, the, the response at some other block that we haven't observed. Or uh, we're kind of, alternatively, we're trying to make inference about processes and having to deal with the block reference data, uh, the, the spatial attributes of the data almost being a nuisance that we have to integrate over. So we have non-independent data because uh, spatially adjacent blocks are going to be more similar to each other than, than uh, non-adjacent blocks. Um, and so we need to account for that, that spatial uh, adjacency and block reference data in order to uh, deal just Kind of integrated out to deal with the, the non-independence you know to account for it similar to what we often did with uh spatial point reference data uh and kind of you know we went beyond creating to thinking about how we build spatial covariances into other data models yes. <clears throat> so a simple example of a spatial 
uh, plot data. Uh, here is, like I said, a lot of, at, at, in terms of political units, this happens to be uh, a map of uh, SAT scores for the uh, contiguous US um, referenced at uh, the state level. And we can see that uh, there are definitely spatial patterns uh, to this data. You know, you see, um, you know, patterns of, of higher scores in the Midwest, lower scores on the coast, kind of intermediate scores uh, in, the, in the mountain, yeah. kind of the, the mountain time zone. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, sometimes you see a lot of adjacency, like you see, you know, across kind of Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey being very similar. We see the South uh, being very similar. We see New England being very similar. Um, and, you know, question, if you want to make inferences about the underlying process, you need to account for the fact that, that adjacent states are behaving similarly. Uh, a, a famous example of needing to do this uh, is when you're trying to you know, make political forecasts at, at large facial scales, such as US presidential elections. And if you fail to account for the fact that uh, the, the error in, in one state is very likely to be similar to the error in another state uh, that mm -hmm. it might be nearby, you there's a definite uh, tendency to be overconfident about uh, interpreting uh, those forecasts and, and failing to account for that spatial covariance can be can you know, lead to very falsely overconfident predictions. So one key concept when it comes to the, the modeling and analysis of spatial, spatially block reference data is this idea of the proximity matrix. And in a general sense, the proximity matrix is kind of the block data analog uh, to our distance matrix. So we saw that when we dealt with point reference data and spatial models that we had to construct this distance matrix representing the distance between all pairwise distances between all points in our data set. Uh, and we also talked about the fact that those distances don't strictly have to be Euclidean distances, you know, the shortest distance along the map, that they could be, you know, gridded distances or they could be, uh, uh, you know, weighted in, in, in different ways, you know, they could be drive times around along roads. Um, and then we, we're going to see the same thing uh, with proximity matrices. Um, so if we have a proximity matrix W, uh, has entities WIJ that tells us about the proximity between site I and site J. Uh, like with distance matrices, distance matrices, the proximity of a site with itself is zero by definition. Uh, but beyond that, you definitely have different choices about how to, to measure the proximity between two sites. So, and, and these bullet points here all, is not an exhaustive list, they're just examples of ways that you might measure proximity. So, you know, one might, one example might be, you know, setting the proximity to one if, um, if block A and block, or block I and block J share a common boundary. Uh, so, you know, if uh, you might say that, that Massachusetts and Connecticut are, are proximal to each other because they share a long boundary in Massachusetts and California or not, they, they don't share any common boundaries or quite far separated. Uh, you could even go beyond that and, you know, maybe put this in as, you know, something like the, the, uh, the length of that shared boundary or uh, something about uh, and depending on what you're trying to study, you, you know, some could be something related to how things might move, you know, could be connections based on interstates or some, or connections based on, you know, major roads or could be, or you could, you know, in theory, you could define proximity in a, in a slightly less physical basis. And maybe, you know, if you thought about proximity defined based on, you know, flight paths or, um, uh, uh, shipping paths where two sites that are not actually physically touching could be considered proximal if, you know, if the process we're interested in involves movement uh, through those modes. There's a lot of ways of defining those proximities. Uh, another option might be uh, defining them based on uh, 
one over the distance between units, which comes kind of brings us back to those ideas of of distance based um, uh, covariance. We're you know, essentially almost saying, you know, we'll go to a place that's analogous to what we do in uh, geostatistics, but instead of using uh, the actual, you know, so you could define that distance as, uh, say, the distance between the centroids of uh, locations or distances between population centers and or something like that, depending on what you're interested in. Uh, you might just set every, you, you know, every uh, W to one, if they're within some distance, you could just set a threshold. Or you could say it's just based on some, you know, your, your M nearest neighbors are all adjacent to you. There's lots of different ways you could define proximity that could vary a lot depending on uh, the type of questions you're trying to ask and the type, you know, how you think uh, the, uh, the, the um, spatial correlations actually work in a, tip, in a system. It's worth noting that um, like with our distance matrices, W is typically symmetric, but it doesn't strictly have to be. You could define, come up with this ways of defining, you know, adjacency that uh, are not necessarily, you know, strictly uh, uh, symmetric. You know, you could have uh, you know, one place that considers, um, you know, someone else to be within, you know, one of their uh, M nearest neighbors, but when you move to that other location, it might have other places that are closer to it and might not consider the, the first place one of its M nearest neighbors. Uh, if W is the raw proximity matrix, we'll also find that we frequently use this tilde W, which is when we take the distance, the proximity matrix and standardize each row uh, by its sum. So we, we sum up all the weights in a row and then we um, standardize, you know, basically divide by um, those and then when we do that, those the elements uh, of W, this this kind of um, little W, uh, really kind of behave as weights. You know, they're the proportion of the the uh, proximity uh, assigned to an individual row, so it's assigned to an individual uh, location. Uh, so, like I said, the Ws are all, elements are often called weights, uh, and you can kind of interpret them as you know, the, the, the relative weight that you're giving uh, proximal sites when you're doing any sort of spatial modeling or spatial, uh, um, yeah, spatial error modeling. It's also worth noting that, that while we typically will define W in terms of first order neighbors, you could also imagine defining I mean, you know, second order or third order uh, spatial proximity. So that, that kind of wraps up the key concepts of spatial block data that I'm next gonna move on to uh, some of exploratory analyses, very analogous to kind of the, the block data analogs to things we talked about in geostatistics like spatial smoothing and, and correlograms and variograms. So there's uh, spatial block analogs of those concepts.